Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Erica. Can you hear me? Yep. Brilliant. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, I think I lost my connection here for a second, but uh, back in the room. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This uh, is an incredibly sunny afternoon here in London. And uh, for those of you that aren't in London, welcome as well. It's uh, 1 p.m. Uh, British summer time here. Um, and we have a uh, a really fantastic program for the next hour and a half or so to present to you. Um, this is one of our online salons here at Stanley Picker Gallery that we devised and started uh, staging through the pandemic and it's working incredibly well as a, as a kind of model for gathering different voices together to discuss projects that we have been working on and Erica Tan here today um, is going to be in discussion with Kathleen Ditzik from the National Gallery of Singapore and Wenny Teo, the writer and historian, around a project um, the, which we staged at the Stanley Picker Gallery um, earlier on this year um, called Barang Barang. It was Erica's, the culmination of Erica's Stanley Picker Fellowship with us here at Kingston University um, and has a kind of range of different kind of elements to the project, including an exhibition and a film, which we're going to show you all in a, in a moment, um, and a new publication, which we're going to also present in a second, brand new publication, Eric is gonna hold, holding it up for us now. We'll talk about that in a second, if that's okay, Erica. So um, the, the way that today's event is going to uh, take place is that we're going to give everyone time to watch uh, the film Barang Barang for the first time online in full. It's about 24 minutes long and we're going to ask you all to follow a link in the chat section at the end of this short introduction uh, to watch that. Then we're going to come back to the Zoom call uh, following the screening and there will be a conversation between Erica, Kathleen and Wenny, which will take place uh, from about 1.30 for about an hour with an opportunity for people to ask questions at that point as well. Today's event is staged in collaboration with Decolonizing Arts Institute and we want to thank Susan Pugh Sanlock uh, for helping us to put the um, occasion together. And I'd like to thank Erica in particular for a fantastic Stanley Picker Fellowship project that we have had to develop um, under some quite unusual conditions with the pandemic. And it's been an absolute pleasure to sort of see the project evolve and develop in this way. Um, and I'd also like to thank Faith, who's there in the background from the Stanley Picker Gallery, coordinating things seamlessly and to Alex Stilwell as well for helping us with the visuals. Alex also works, is working on the publication with Erica. So Erica, would you like to say a few words about the project and the publication and then we can... Yeah, it's it's difficult to see, but um, here it is. It's at the moment, it's over four meters long. Um, Alex and I have been working on this and um, there's going to be an edition of 50. Um, I've strangely price them 15 pounds to 17 pounds based on the edition you buy the idea that the later the edition the more expensive it becomes um and it's just a it's just an idea that's also kind of comes it connects to today's talk which is very much around speculation so there's this idea of sort of speculation within the pricing of this book but that's just a little kind of aside um it's it encompasses the work that was um, shown called Barang Barang in Stanley Picker Gallery, but also includes um, the sort of first iteration of it that took place in um, Taipei Fine Arts Museum, which Kathleen Dietzik and Fang, um, Fang Zhu Sui also curated. So um, within it, there's sort of a series of images that encapsulates, whether you can see this or not, encapsulates the exhibition um, in the gallery. Um, with all the various kind of um, elements, film works, as well as um, objects. And then on the other side, um, there is a series of texts um, to which Wenny and Kathleen were invited to contribute and also forms a sort of basis of our discussions today um, and various other te texts that I've included as well. So um, that's available through the gallery. 
and um, it's it is we are launching that today, although you know not physically, but here virtually. Um, but I can leave that. We can perhaps pull it out later. Otherwise, it will there'll be information on online um, about that coming up soon. Um, I think we can perhaps go straight um, away now. Um, you can watch the film and think that it's eight minutes past. So maybe we start back at, it may not be enough time to watch the film if we yeah. start back at 1.30, but maybe 1.35, which means you could all go and grab a cup of tea or something else if you wanted to. Um, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So could okay. I, just, I just give people some, it's very simple instructions, but if you click on the link in the chat section of the Zoom call, that will take you through to the uh, web page for Erica's project at the gallery. And if you scroll down, you'll see the film. You can play it in the in the window of the web page, but it's much better if you click on the little full screen icon on the right hand side and you can watch it in full screen on your computer. We're doing it this way because it, it avoids a series of technical issues about playing video through uh, Zoom. Um, so it should run a lot smoother at your end. And it also means that you can um, watch it at your leisure. The film will be live on our website until um, this time next week, until the end of Saturday, the 16th of July. So you, if, if you do have any problems at all today, um, please uh, interact with us in the, in the chat or Q&A section if you have a problem and you want to watch it in the next half an hour. But otherwise, you do have an opportunity to watch it after the talk as well. OK, so we'll, we'll be back here in about 25, 30 minutes. I don't make art. I make sculpture and prints. I am Fay, Fairy Fay. Cunliffe, Tan, Fay Tan, Say Tan, Satan. I am Dora. I'm Dora. I am Dora. I am Chandana. Georgette. Zhang Ying. Mrs. Chen. Artist, painter, pioneer. Artist, sculptor. 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 And designer. Painter. Potter. Fashion designer. Filmmaker. Documenter. Observer.
Matter. Model unnamed. Chinese Head. 1930-31. Edition 6 of 8. The Green-Black Pattern. Model unnamed. The Eastern Head. Also known as Creamy Head. 1927-28. Edition 5 of 8. With olive and light green patina. Model unnamed. Hindu Head. 1930-33. Edition 2 of 8. With black brown patina. Model unnamed. Chinese Head. Also known as the Chinese philosopher, Chinese intellectual, Chinaman, and Chinese art critic. 1925-26. Edition unknown. Okay, I'm hoping I can slowly pull you away from the screening if you're still watching the video. Um, and also to welcome Kathleen Ditsik and Wenyi Chio to this conversation. Um, hi both. So this is going to be a slightly um, open-ended, but also slightly choreographed, unfolding speculative conversation. Um, and I just want to thank them in advance for participating, but also contributing um, short texts to the book. Um, for those of you that don't know Kathleen and Wenny, um, Kathleen Dietzik is a curator based in Singapore, now working with the National Gallery Singapore, but previously also curated independently. Her research interests include exhibitionary histories of Southeast Asia, global histories of capitalism, and the enduring cultural legacies of the Cold War. I'm really pleased Kat can join us today, um, as she is someone I met quite a few years ago in Singapore and enjoyed her curiosity, critical, and somewhat combative but generous engagement with artists, their works, and the broader social political framing that the discourse and making of artwork sits within. We recently worked together on her curatorial project, Art Histories of a Forever War, Modernism Between Space and Home, which was shown at Taipei Fine Art Museum this year and last year, and was co-curated with Fang Zisu from National um, NUS Museum Singapore. Kat and Fang um, included the earlier version of Barang Barang, which um, included a large body of my mother's work alongside an earlier version of the two channel video work you've just seen. Now I've got to say, um, and this is something that um, is possibly interesting for this conversation or not, the piece of work you've just seen is called Barang Barang, but it's also called Spectral Entanglements. And the project that I showed with Kat is called Barang Barang, but is also called My Mother Told Me. So um, I'm falling into a trap immediately of kind of not having consistent titling for my work. Anyway, um, so Kat also took my Chippendale Chinese Dancing Boys to New York, um, where it was shown in one of the World Trade Center towers as part of um, a curatorial project she led called As the West Slept, um, and was a performer uh, consortium project hosted and organized by Silver Art Projects in New York. Um, and maybe that's just to flag that a previous work of mine worked with all um, young Chinese men. Um, and this one was sort of, <laughs> this is sort of focusing on women. Um, and uh, Wenyi Chiu um, is based in London and is a writer, researcher, curator, and senior lecturer in modern and contemporary art in the Courtauld Institute of Art, University of London. Her research centers on layered histories of transnational encounter, geopolitics, ecology, infrastructure, and speculative futures in Chinese and Sinophone visual cultures. 
I'm actually not sure any longer where I met Wenny, um, where we met. Um, it could be through mutual friends in London or at a Tate Research Asia event. Either way, it um, is for me also the Singapore connection we both share that creates for me a certain kind of nebulous national bonding. Um, she starts her essay in the publication, says back home. Um, and it's great because I know what she means by back home. Um, and I, she immediately takes me with her. Um, so it's this Singapore connection or someone who is based in the UK, but could reach intellectually and emotionally from one island to the other that led me to invite Wendy to contribute to this publication and also to an earlier artist publication called um, Come Cannibalize Us, Why Don't You, which followed a sort of um, exhibition I had in NUS Museum Singapore. Um, this time around, um, brilliantly coincidental, but also timely, Wenny is currently preparing a monograph for the work of Kim Lim. Um, and there is going to be um, a retrospective of Kim Lim's work in National Gallery Singapore, I think coming up towards the end of this year, um, or maybe next year. And Kat obviously will be probably involved in that as well. Um, so really, um, welcome to you both. Now, just before we continue, because um, I'm not sure who will be in the audience, but um, being aware that when one works transnationally, that there are always going to be um, major gaps um, in, in, in knowledge um, exchange. So I just wanted to quickly share my screen and to um, introduce, introduce the four um, protagonists in the film, the four women. Um, just to check, is that just showing the black and white images? Kat, and if you give me a nod. Yep, okay, great, thanks. All right, so very quickly um, to run through the artists uh, who are featured there, who I'm kind of working with as references. Um, to the top left is Dora Goodine, who was born in 1895 and died in 1991 in London. She was born in Latvia, um, which was then a province within the Russian empire. Um, and she was born to Jewish parents. She grew up in Estonia where she trained trained as a sculptor and then lived in Paris um, in 1924 to 29 and then went to Singapore between 1930 and 35. And after that, she came um, to London and settled there and lived there for the rest of her life. Um, she made a piece of work called Chinese Head. It goes by several names, um, Chinese philosopher, um, Chinaman. It was exhibited in Paris in 1926 and received great reviews. And she then went on to become the first female artist commissioned to make work for the British government in Singapore. Bourdine made a series of Asian heads during her stay in, London, in Singapore, four of which are held in Parliament and House Singapore, and some of which are in the Tate, London. Um, they are said to be some of the Tate's earliest so-called Southeast Asian works. Um, and in 1930, she remarried Richard Hare and built her studio home in Dorich House, Kingston, which is where the film was um, made, my film was made, shot. So to the top right, there's Georgette Chen, also known as Chang Li Ying. She was born in 1906. Some people would say she was born in Paris, which is in fact what she says in an oral history interview. Um, other people have um, since then, you know, um, found documentation that says she was born in China. She trained in Paris and in the United States and established herself in Paris as an artist before coming to Singapore via Hong Kong, China and Malaysia. She was in Singapore from 1953 to 1939, so approximately sort of 40 years, um, and is now considered um, in Singapore as a pioneer artist. She is seen as a fundamental part of the Nanyang Fine Art Academy and the Nanyang Group and received a Singapore Cultural Medallion in 1982. Georgette is best known for her local portraits, local landscapes and baskets of fruit. Um, Georgette also learned to speak Malay and went by the name Chandana to her Malay artist friends. On the bottom right um, is Kim Lim, born in 1936, Singapore. She spent a large part of her childhood actually in Malaysia. And in 1954, at the age of 18, she went to London to study at Central St. Martin's School of Art, um, which is where I now teach. She remained in London for the rest of her life. So from 1954 to 1997, she was in London and married um, acclaimed British sculptor, William Turnbull. She had two sons who have now inherited both her and her husband's estates. Um, which they now manage. In, 19, uh, in 2019, she is found to be the most, uh, the highest publicly collected female black artist in the UK. This is data taken from the Black Artists and Modernism Research Project. And during her life, uh, she did have exhibitions in Singapore, um, but the collecting and celebration of her work really in Singapore has been more, much more sort of post-humous. Um, 
bottom left um, is Fei Tan, my mother. Also, my father is featured there. Sorry, that's a, I'm, I'm allowed to show my father and mother rather than just my mother on the end because it's my mother. Um, anyway, she was born in 1940 in the UK. Whilst she was in London learning um, shop window display in the 1950s, she met my father, Leong Seng, who had been sent to London to study after the Japanese occupation of Malaya. After Leong's return to Singapore, Faye emigrated to Singapore where she lived 40 years. Initially a self-taught artist and ceramicist, she also attended Nanyang Fine Art Academy life drawing and painting classes in the 1970s and later completed her BA degree in Fine Art and Goldsmiths, London. In 1987, we are both included in the same exhibition in the National Museum Singapore called Transformation Image, Contemporary Ceramics in Singapore. Okay, so before um, we really kind of continue, I just want to give some context um, to today's talk. Both Wenny and Kat were invited to think into ideas of speculation as method for the book and today's discussion. Speculation has come to be very central in the way I've worked on this project and indeed um, in previous works also. One of the last projects was called Apajika, the misplaced comma. Apajika in Malay actually means what if. So not only the what if um, in terms of the, the current project, it's not only the what if, but also the how much. And by that, I mean speculation as a method for dealing with the gaps in the archive and our systems of knowledge um, is important but also perhaps thinking about the financial reference speculation has, and that it can be seen as the process by which value is added through a certain amount of risk taking. So for instance, financial speculation creates profit and liquidity in the market, or perhaps can be seen as unfixing bodies of knowledge or art histories to allow for new terms of references and new sets of values and resonances. For me, speculation provides a way of engaging with missing information, but also certain kinds of potential for shaking things up. So the initial invitation um, to Kat and Wendy was to invite them to respond to the overall project of Barang Barang and also to possibly reflect on how speculation within their positions as art historians, curators, writers might also be engaged with um, uh, in a positive way or maybe seen as negatively. So because no one has read the essays that they've written, I'm going to do a very quick um, sort of summary and then invite both of them to sort of come in and um, correct me or add to or perhaps expand for a little bit. Um, and then seeing on how the conversations go, um, I have got a series of slides that are sort of prompts that we might also talk about. So that's a slightly choreographed element. Um, and the less choreographed element might be that we chat so much that I don't need the slides and you know, there we go. So um, let me just move this on. Wenny's text is called An Archival Impulses and focuses on the form the work Barang Barang takes and indeed speculates on its agency and ability to represent, in her words, transnational experience and speak to the meandering messy business of artistic research, imagination and exploration, personal, political, factual and fictitious. Wenny refers health to Hal Foster's term, the An Archival Impulse, in writing about the work as a multivalent disruptive form of art making and reworlding that is to quote Foster, less concerned with absolute origins than, up, than obscure traces, unfulfilled beginnings or incomplete projects in art and in history alike that might offer points of departure again. So this is an image of um, the exhibition Barang Barang in Stanley Picker. Kathleen's text um, called Barang Between a Mother and a Daughter a feminist reshaping of art history. Kathleen turns her attention to institutional roles, to national collections and to processes by which art histories are constructed and managed. Here she writes, the installation is as much a mediation on women's artists associated with Singapore's art history as it is a surfacing of her mother's artist legacy that has yet to be seriously studied. And following on from this, Kathleen returns to the archive where she focuses on transformation image, contemporary ceramics in Singapore, which um, the, the catalog cover is up on the image there. Um, this exhibition was held in the National Museum of Singapore in 1987 and featured 309 works by 42 ceramicists and was curated by TK Sabapathy. Importantly, both the work of my mother and myself were included in this exhibition. And Kathleen goes on to interview Sabapathy recently, capturing information that would otherwise not be documented. This attention to the document, to the archive, to the ordering of knowledge, in some respects shifts the meaning of speculation away from unfounded hypotheses 
to that of a speculation which might produce additional value. So the sort of second, the kind of more financial model perhaps of um, speculation um, might be in order here. Um, the other image on, on the screen is uh, the project she curated in Taiwan. So I will stop the slide sharing and we can return to looking and talking to each other. Um, and um, really at this point, it would be great to sort of open up to both of you to see how you'd like to respond to that or add to it. Um, and just to say to the audience as well, um, this is not a very moderated conversation. It's quite open-ended and casual. Um, unfortunately, we can't speak with you directly, but if you do have any thoughts, concerns, questions, add them to the chat um, and one of us will hopefully sort of see them and pick up and um, perhaps respond to you. Okay, so shall we unmike Kathleen and Wenny and get you in? Yeah, so. Hi everyone. Like to start? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much, Erica, for, for the invitation into the gallery as well. Um, and for providing this amazing backdrop. So it looks like I'm in a rave with uh, ghosts of the past. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be able to, to talk to you and to Kathleen as well about your, about your work. Um, and thank you for that, that summary of the, of the, the text. Uh, that was really useful. Yeah, okay. Well then, did you wanna um, expand at all on, on the text or um, the thinking around it? Okay, well, <laughs> I can try. Um, so I think you know, I, it was a it was a very interesting provocation to me to think about <clears throat> speculation as a method, and you know, and as you mentioned, uh, being from Singapore myself, you know, the term uh, barang barang has a particular kind of currency. I think you know when it's used in a kind of local but in a vernacular kind of context, um, and I think my point of departure was really thinking about how so much of your work engages with you know, the colonial archive and forms of museological display, you know, cataloging and so on, and the way that, that histories are presented and that kind of um, quality of disruption and reinvestigation and you know, indeed cannibalism that you bring to these kind of very um, uh, weighty and structured uh, concepts of history. Um, so for me, Barang Barang was, was kind of an anti-collection. I think that's something I talked about briefly in the text as well, you know, that it, uh, the term itself implies a kind of cumulative disorder, which I perceive to be both kind of psychic and emotional and as well as material. Um, so I was just, you know, playing around with the idea of the archive and, uh, and Hal Foster's portmanteau term and the anarchival, kind of, a, of what I see as a kind of combination of the word anarchy and archive. Um, I think was quite a useful point to begin. Um, I really, uh, uh, you know, I think there was so much to write about and we were given quite a, 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 you know, a firm word limit. So I kind of, I mean, I was very interested in the idea of the unpicking and unraveling uh, of these different historical figures and the, you know, the, the way they've been questioning and rethinking and reimagining the way in which they've been presented, especially more recently and inserted into our historical discourses. Um, and had I more space, I think I would have found it quite interesting to think about uh, the idea of critical fabulation, uh, which is an idea that's, that's been brought forward by uh, Sadia Hartman, you know, in thinking about how you know, speculation as a form of biographical uh, imagining an encounter um, can be performed in the context of, of, um, of uh, you know, the kind of duration or limit of film as well. Um, and, uh, and I think that I'm, I'm, you know, for me, it was more about the kind of, um, I think something that, that struck a chord with me and I think with anybody who, who uh, you know, artists and our researchers and our historians is that kind of interface between the, the subjects and objects of your study and your own kind of complicity in, in these narratives as well. So there's a real kind of proximity there, which I think had an as added resonance because of your kind of personal trajectory and, and biography. And I was really uh, very drawn to that. Um, and I loved how, you know, uh, Kat's text uh, you know, really focused on the sort of more institutional structures and thinking about ideas of, you know, commercialization and, and so on. And I think the two texts um, actually work really well together. Uh, and, and at this juncture, I'm sure Kat would like to talk a little bit more about her, her text as well. 
Thanks, Winnie. And <laughs> thanks, Erica, for the invitation and also to the Stanley Picker, um, Pickering Gallery as well. This is, it's nice to be able to actually extend these conversations because I feel that, um, Erica, what you're actually constellating are like two different conversations that you've been having with, with Winnie and me separately, and now we're sort of converging. Um, and, it, and it feels like this conversation has been happening actually for quite a while for us when we're talking about um, methods of speculation, merely because um, there are parallels between my curatorial work, obviously, as an independent, when I was an independent curator before I joined the institution, of writing histories through exhibitions almost speculatively because of gaps. Um, so, so, you know, the exhibition that you mentioned um, and one that we worked on, if you recall, in New York um, as the West Lep was actually a way of looking at how artists have constellated what Asian, the history of Asian capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. And its imagination. And, um, and so it, it was really so okay. So when you when you approached me with, with with this task of maybe thinking about speculation as a method, I felt like this was a conversation we've been having for a very very long time. Um, but um, okay, so going back to the text, uh, I actually deviated from the task at hand. I think initially what I had wanted to do was lean into. Um, the financial speculation, which you kind of see a bit in the piece coming out because at the very last minute, I had the opportunity to interview Zababati about transformational image, which becomes a very important show on ceramics in Singapore. And he follows that up with actually another important show on sculpture. And yet the funny thing is that um, Erica, you, Heidi and your mom, presented work technically within this. And one of the things that struck me when we were working on uh, Barang Barang and its install at Taipei Fine Art Museum was the, and actually spending time with the work was how much your mother's, um, how, how much your mother's estate or the, the works from your mother that you included also included works that you made together as a family. Mm. There was that Chinese painting um, project within that, but then going and discovering what you told me was your first exhibition, which is this transformational image, um, and discovering inside there that um, Heidi, your sister, and your mom had had submitted a work together, and that here it was was that family sort of interface again, and that be that became interesting for me in the sense that I realized that your practice has always been very collaborative and in that open-endedness collaboration comes, um, and I comes that moments of speculation, I, I think because you're kind of creating new narratives together and, and you enter your process, it seems almost in a very open-ended kind of way. And it made me wonder how much of that came out of your early experiences actually working with your mom and I thought it was really and so I shifted the piece unfortunately than what we all kind of discussed because of this um, because I felt there needed to be some kind of notation because it felt with barang barang it was coming you were coming full circle again mm -hmm. you know with what transfer transfer transformational image seemed to imply to me um, so yeah does that kind of expand a bit? It, I'm sorry, Winnie, it doesn't answer your question directly, but the financial side of this is obviously when we start talking about estates and artworks as assets, where do we draw the line? And you've done something really interesting, um, Erica, by obviously including your mom's work in a large installation, um, putting your mom within, art, in, yeah, within an art historical context, pretty much creating the narrative, um, one could step back and easily see a critique of, you know, how art history, art markets kind of get produced mm -hmm. and, um, and get produced and you're kind of subverting all of those things, right? So. I think there's a lovely kind of connection between both of you speaking. So um, but both what you've just said, um, Kat, but also um, Wenny, I think you use the word complicity and I was thinking about complicity. Um, there is a sort of sense of complicity I'm having with, um, the, the, the project is trying to do two, well, several things. <laughs> One thing is actually um, the reason, I am interested in process by, process by which artworks accrue value 
um, or become valued or create resonance. So one of the, um, not really a, an objective, but maybe the underlying kind of thing is I have this body of work of my mother's um, who doesn't have a very strong association with either um, Britain or with Singapore in terms of her art production. Um, uh, and, and yet she continued to make for a large period of her life. Um, I was involved in a talk um, this last year, which was around collections um, and exploring public collections and how one might sort of diversify the, the collections and thinking um, through this and sort of talking to curators who seem to suggest that um, as long as an artist had a sort of um, continuity in her work, um, that therefore and a long period of, of work, that in itself might be the reasoning why that they, they might be collected. Um, now, Kat's disappeared, which um, is probably to do with her. She'll come back in. She'll come and go, Kat will. Um, so, yes, what I was going to say, the the idea of longevity of a practice or a sustained practice doesn't actually ever explain why somebody isn't included in a collection. So I kind of worked on this idea of thinking around notions of not product placement, that's come to me more recently, a really crass way of talking about it, but about associations and often associations that artists have with each other that either one are not documented, um, art historically, they don't seem to be considered that important. And women's histories often, there are these incredible connections that again, don't seem to um, you, you know, get documented or written about. Um, and, and then on another side, which is way in which artists do use very um, forcefully kind of a way of connecting their, um, their practice to another artist's practice. So um, if you see, you know, on Facebook often, you know, if you're included in a show and it's with other artists that you really respect, you go, wow, look who I'm showing with, you know, and it's sort of an association. Now you can think about that skeptically, but you can also think about it, that it, that it um, perhaps there's a lot more that we could uncover in the ways that artists talk to each other and engage with each other. So I suppose that's the background for bringing these four women together. Um, but if I just again share my screen um, and take you to, I think, I think it's maybe let's go to this one. All right. So we're talking about in a way constellations and complicities, but constellations perhaps in contexts. Um, the image is on the left is my mum and my dad. So my mother. I don't know if you can see my hand on the screen. Can you see my hand? So my, there's my mother and there's my father and it's probably at a business dinner um, and she doesn't look very happy. Um, and I've got lots of photographs of her in Singapore where she really does appear to be the, you know, the, the sore thumb or the sort of, you know, the person that stands out as somehow kind of, you know, the wrong, the wrong person, the wrong space. Um, and then to the right hand side, this is an image I found whilst going through her archives and, and getting work ready for Taiwan. And I just thought, um, really interesting. So this image here is her um, here and she's sitting next door to um, Aneng Teng, who's kind of um, really important um, ceramicist in Singapore. And she's looking, that's her element. That's in her, her not in her studio, but in his studio. Um, and through a process of uh, getting lots of other people to identify who these people are, it turns out that, you know, there she's sitting at a table with these other male potters, um, quite well known, um, but important, significant male potters. And there's one other woman in the room. So um, Asaf Rahman, um, unidentified woman, uh, Chusu Kim, possibly, I think um, Chusu Kim is the, the son of the person that, um, worked the dragon kilns in Singapore, I think. Um, my sister will be uh, screaming at me if I'm wrong. But anyway, Lim Chong Bang here. And so that is Lim Chong Bang. That is and Tang Tuan Yong. And this guy here is Po Chap Yi, who actually um, doing a little bit more research. He was based in Britain for a long time. He was a Malaysian ceramicist um, based in Britain for a very long time. Um, sort of selling lots of work here. So maybe I don't know if what whether you find this interesting, but but for me, these two images are very um, 
And it's about placing somebody into a context and whether these different contexts, the different stories that they produce. So the next image is also about placements. Um, and Wenny, I thought maybe you'd probably be able to speak a little bit to the image on the left, which um, shows Kim Lim here and has become a sort of an image that is talked about quite a bit. Um, for me, it's a moment where we see Kim Lim sort of, um, she is uh, on the all female annual committee for the Hayward sort of show of 1978. Um, and what it seems to suggest is that she's in the thick of it here. She's right at the center of a kind of major sort of um, art system, curatorial sort of process. Um, and then this image again is my mother in that. And this is my piece of work here at the age of something like 16, 17 was included on the cover um, with Iskander Jail and Enning Teng's work, again, to sort of hugely um, important ceramicists, uh, male ceramicists in, in Singapore. Um, does anyone feel like, does anyone feel like kind of using this as a basis of starting to talk about something? Um, sorry, Catherine, please. <laughs> Winnie, you go ahead first, go ahead. Uh, no, I just thought that the, the, you know, the juxtaposition here of these three images is, is really interesting. And you're talking about, in a way, um, uh, retracing kinds of points of, of, of contact and collaboration and, and networks, I think, within a particular artistic milieus at a given time. And, uh, you know, the kind of juxtaposition between your mother amidst all these sort of well-known male uh, established artists and potters in Singapore, as it were, uh, with this kind of very sort of representative, represented to, uh, you know, kind of powerful image of, a, of the kind of all women committee at the Hayward, you know, they seem to really speak to two different, um, uh, you know, cultural contexts, as it were, national contexts as well, perhaps. Um, but I think that what's interesting about the inclusion, you know, the, the representation or being uh, given a space to be represented, to represent oneself, um, is, uh, you know, is, is the kind of, the kind of, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, corollary to that is, is sort of the idea of refusal, you know, to kind of, um, for artists to also, uh, to kind of challenge, uh, established narratives or, uh, challenge their placement within certain canons or, or milieus. And in the case of Kim Lim, of course, she, very famously, um, you know, uh, some years later did not participate, was one of the artists who did not choose to participate in the Rashid Arin exhibition, The Other Story. Um, and I think there is a kind of productive tension there. I mean, a lot of it has been made of that kind of act of, of refusal in a sense, but there is a kind of pull and tug, you know, across, uh, across uh, different spans of time as well. Um, so I think the durational element, you know, of how figures kind of dip in and out of uh, of, of narratives of history and of canons and discourses is something that um, is, is also worth bearing in mind. And your project now in kind of piecing together and recuperating your, your you know, Feitan's legacy, I think, um, you know, speaks to that sort of the brokenness of, of, of art historical narratives, if that makes sense, uh, which I think also carries through in your work where you're kind of imagining this encounters that never took place between these uh, various women artists um, you know, across space and time, as it were. Mm. So I don't know if that's a productive way to, to to consider the images that you've shown, but it was something that that came to mind. I think the refusal aspect of it and agency in that process is interesting. Um, I'm often, I think, I'm often looking at, towards the institutions as having the kind of primary sense of power and agency, um, and art historians as writing this material up. Um, the Sabapathy text in the exhibition catalogue, I think, focuses on um, uh, the male potters. Um, there's not much, um, I, if anything, I think, mentioned of the other. So it's, a, you know, the kind of those moments in time where it's a national um, exhibition, but it reinstates the value of some as opposed to the others that are still included in the show. Um, Kat, I think you probably had things to say, but I'm also interested in you know, working for the National Gallery. There's a sort of sense in which um, these kinds of histories and these kinds of documents that point to or verify um, networks 
become also ways of placing an artist or or sensing where they are placed and what value they brought to it or whether they were participant to something or, or not. Um, and my project has in a way chosen these four different artists because of the way they all had an association with Singapore, but not everyone is equally valued. Now, of course, not everyone will be equally valued in one way if we just want to look at perhaps art practice, but often it's not just art practice that somebody is not included. Um, you know, it's, it's not the value of their work, the reason why they're not included. So I'm going to, it, rather than me continue, I'd rather hear, Kat, your sort of thoughts about this. Yeah. Um, okay. So I'll caveat just for the audience. I mean, I joined the National Gallery six months ago. <laughs> so a lot of, um, so what I would actually say to you and what you're talking about and what, and your reference to the gallery per se in constructing historical narratives. I, am, I mean, one of the things that I find really exciting about the National Gallery is uh, the curatorial department there is definitely actually actively trying to like reckon with the whole idea of what it means to decolonize the canon and what it means to write the canon um, from scratch in some, some ways, right? And and if you and if and if you're able to do that, what are the values you put forward to that? Um, I'll park it there because I won't really speak more to that because I think what you're actually getting at in the way that we construct um, affinities, the way we construct narratives, and the way we construct how an, an artistic network kind of emerges, or and therefore then whether one artist as opposed to another is is um, more important to remember is not something that I think is just sitting within the museum space and un unfolding within the museum space. I mean, I can just say that when I, you know, when we're even talking about the evaluation and ensuring of an artwork, right? And, and you know, we were talking about this even before, like how, how do you even go about to, estimate what the potential market value of a work of an, if an artist doesn't have a track record of sales, right? And then therefore, what is the legal value of that artwork or, and what is the narratives around it? And, and ownership um, becomes obviously very contentious, you know, like these things play out into not just how, um, these things then play out into how collections are imagined, first of all, and then collections are then uh, put together and organized after. And the thing is, these things are also not static. Um, I find that the narratives, and I'm speaking now independent from the National Gallery, I mean, working across institutions around the world, when an artist comes to the fore, it seems to be as much the, imagine, the political imaginations of a time that need a certain figurehead and then therefore certain figures come to the fore as well as the, the, lit the literal grunt, grunt networking that happens on the back end that no one kind of sees that family estates do. Um, and we've talked about this, how much family estates um, and what happens with a legacy and how a legacy is platformed, presented, packaged, created into, you know, publications or exhibitions or simply through family websites, right? Um, which you see a lot, like everyone has a sort of little family website and then maybe three years down the line, you know, um, someone stumbles on the family website and then you realize that this person has a significance in the larger history and so forth. Um, I don't wanna ramble anymore along those lines, but my point is, my point in response to what you're saying is that the work that you're actually is the work that Barang Barang kind of does on an imaginative level is really actually paralleling a lot of work in terms of actual value creation. And that value creation is tied to how we determine some artist is important. And so much of the, that importance is then is often triangulated through networks. And those networks are then triangulated through narratives that fit some contemporary goal, right? So like, you know, some of, you know, it's so funny. It's um, because like, even when I look at the way that your work is right, is written about Erica, you know, like if you look at the 2000s, everyone was a um, global, global artist, you know, everyone was talking about nobility and 
and you know by now we're talking about something completely you know we talked about after a while we start talking about global art histories and we talk about decolonization you know the language shifts to talk to frame someone in a different network as being significant um and so the little tidbits of history right then get mobilized in that way so i i don't know if this helps in responding to you um and and your prompt in some way but for me, what's more interesting is I don't think it's necessarily something that museums themselves produce. Obviously, they are the production houses, right? Because they put large national collections together. And when it's when you know when a national collection is put together, it it is buttressed by a kind of national narrative and inherently therefore has importance. But the sort of navigating the construction of that narrative is so much part of a larger international, I would say um market-based system of creating value which i think had and that value is so much tied to how much we determine what is an asset and what is value in relation to an asset does that make sense yeah I'm so i'm 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 not saying that museums are not responsible of course they're responsible because the bread and butter is dealing with these narratives right but i also think that even the museum structures shift in relation to these other structures that are part of that are outside the art world, to be honest. OK, um, yeah. I'm going to show you another slide, which is not outside the art world. It's very central to the art world, but it kind of goes off on what you've just spoken about, yeah. which is um, examples of two collections of work um, and so on the right, on the left hand side, we've got Dora Gordine's work collected in the Tate, and then we've got right hand side image of um, Kim Lim's works collected in the Tate. And I think of interest to me, and maybe this conversation is that, um, you know, in both kind of these collections, there is a large amount of work that has been donated um, to the Tate. So through friends and gallerists, um, in terms of Dora Gordine's work. Um, and in Kim Lin's work, certainly pieces definitely been bought, but also donated by the artists themselves. Um, also galleries that show her work have donated work. Um, and so I wonder how that plays into all of this, you know, because in a way it's like, it, it's right, it's not just the um, institutions, it's also the friends, the family, the supporters, um, and there's something going on here which is like contributing to the institution, to the collection, because of the importance of having your work collected in major institutions. Um, now, I know, I think, you know, we kind of know that this happens, but I just thought it was a nice moment to sort of share that. Um, but also whether there's anything else that you'd want to say to that, because is this a moment in time where this idea of speculation again um, comes in, where it's a sort of speculative gesture of contributing something so that it can potentially accrue some kind of either cultural value or um, financial value. So financial value for the gallery. Um, uh, and um, what the thinking around this is in relationship to art histories and curation um, and your roles in these processes yourselves. So I'll take the stop there. Right, so uh, yeah, I think that that's a, that's a really important issue. I think Erica, you know, the sort of, behind the scenes as it were of the museum, right? You know, the kind of the ways in which collections are built and in which works are acquired and the kind of, you know, uh, networks that, that, that feed into those processes. And of course, you know, the kind of economic stakes which are, uh, you know, not, not as visible perhaps as, as the material um, displays that we see in, 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 in uh, museums and, and collections as well. And I think in my text, I quoted this idea from Susan Stewart, uh, you know, that talks about how this, you know, the kind of um, uh, the organ organizational logic, or rather, I think the spatial whole of the collection, I think she put it, always supersedes the kind of individual narratives that lie behind uh, the objects and the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, this, this kind of uh, interrupts that, that idea that the two can be quite so easily prized apart. But of course, Susan Stewart was referring to kind of the relationship between colonialism and, and collecting practices. So there was a kind of extractive logic there. But in the context of modern uh, rewriting modern art history, as it were, and, and, and seeing how that may be legible through museum collections and practices of collection, collecting <laughs> have a very personal element as well, as we've been discussing, you know. Um, 
but I this is why I thought the work was very interesting because I thought that what what uh, occurred to me was the kind of uh, the performativity of it, the artificiality of that encounter that you kind of imagine between these figures, you know, and I think the use of humor actually made it quite a subversive piece to me, at least that, that was how I was reading it, you know, the kind of choreography of, act, uh, of, of uh, action and the things that they're discussing, you know, the, the protagonists are talking about, uh, these are kind of uh, common, you know, they're kind of quite intimate co uh, communal experiences that they, I mean, sorry, uh, common experiences that they shared as sort of um, um, uh, figures who were kind of cross-border agents, you know, in a sense, but there was also something quite um, banal in a sense about the conversations that they were having, right? So it's sort of like, oh, you've had that experience, me too. And, you know, so I, I, I kind of saw that as you being very self-conscious about the kind of um, the ways in which connections perhaps are forged, you know, when one is in the process of doing research into an artist or several artists, you know, your mind kind of goes, kind of clings on to every kind of point of connection or commonality one might have between them. Um, and that's something to do, I think, with the task of, of writing and the task of research. And um, so I thought it was a really kind of interesting meta uh, playing out perhaps a kind of imaginary kind of fantasy that was being constructed as well as being um, a work that was uh, quite subversive in that sense of how, you know, systems of value, uh, you know, almost kind of artificial economies, I think are, are created as well. Mm. Could we, if we just for two seconds, go back to your image before, um, Erica? Because I don't think you told everyone what the title of that work was. Um, transformation. The, image. <clears throat> yeah, the transformation oh. image. Um, uh, the not this one, but the yeah, the one before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it's that, um, that one. Yes, because um, just kind of expanding on this question of, uh, you know sort of like like finding these connections and i i thought winnie you would enjoy this um y your work there is called stick together boys yeah and basically we just had this <laughs> we just spoke about how that show um put a lot of focus on the male ceramicist and yet interestingly sababati said that he he spent a long time selecting the images for this cover and deliberately chose your work because it was um well it was figurative it was you know moving between you know it, it was figurative but but what he exactly said and I don't I don't have my my notes for that but I remember he he almost said it was um your work was aggressively resisting what ceramics was at that moment basically and it was this and and so it was almost like he was um I'm reporting now or he kind of the sense I had from our conversation was that that work that he of yours right and I didn't realize you were 16 when you did this and I don't know whether he knows that either actually um is that he chose it because it was supposed to be fighting with these other two works of and resisting Ang Tang's and Iskanda Jalil's ceramic works. Mm -hmm. And so this is interesting because, you know, what it's it's what Barang Barang is also kind of doing when it's talking about these histories, right? It is almost this resistance. And there's something really ironic that your title was Stick Together Boys. That you've only made me aware of that now as you're talking about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I know what the title was. I haven't forgotten it that much. But yes, it was um, as I went through the catalogue when I found it more recently, I was surprised that the um, the essay focused so specifically on just a couple um, and the voices were all of these male. Um, but 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 surely he wasn't using this ironically. I, I, to be honest, he, he chose it from an aesthetic position is what the yeah. sense of conversation. I mean, it bears another conversation with him, obviously, and it would be interesting actually to have both of you yeah. to speak. Um, I mean, what I tried to do with my piece is anything in quotations is word for word what he said. It's his words, you know, and he, he gave a, he gave us the permission to publish that, you know, um, with his words. So in a sense, I was creating a little bit of an art his, historical scrap, 
in that yeah. essay for someone else to pick up at another time, I suppose. Um, because obviously in speaking to him, actually this show was part of a, lot, uh, a series of shows that he was doing at this time, which were actually kind of importing mappings for Singapore art um, at the time, but also like, he he is in many ways in many ways a defining figure of um that i and other art historians i think based in singapore and who work with singapore and the region refer to um his work mm. um his work his memories his archives um are really form a framework that a lot of us reference right and so this is also something that's kind of interesting because um you know, you're included in the show and you're 16, right? <laughs> and this is like your first show. Your mom gets you into it, right? That's the story, yeah. if I, I remember correctly. Um, and your mom had some amazing pieces as well. And there were 300 works, but the catalog only shows a few a few photographs. It's mm -hmm. not comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, your mom gets one photograph, you get one. Um, but of course you showed something like 10 different works, actually. You, you yourself had three. In the show did i have um, three? Oh yes i did have three yes yeah. i think i might yeah. still have them as well um the, the, oh the, really the, okay the the, the the barang barang of my life that i take with me places <laughs> and only maybe from this conversation does it suddenly become maybe apparent or um that i become aware of oh i must i must keep that work <laughs> you know it's part of um i'm not really into building legacies of myself because actually my experience of my mother's work is that um, as artists we produce a lot and um, it's actually quite difficult to take care of material um, and when you talked about collaboration before in terms of maybe starting working with my, my mother the Raku piece on the um, cover here I was working in Raku because she was exploring how to make Raku how to create the glazes how not to burst things and she was um, developing kind of the, these methods herself and so we as kids all joined in um, just like when she made Banqiang kind of fired pots, we dug the holes for her and we helped to build the fires and, you know, um, we went in, we were there basically. Um, and the work in on the right hand side of the image for Taipei, I mean, this is starts showing that I, I have actually been able to show my mother's work in a large um, museum in Taipei work that has not been seen for over 30 years may never may never have been seen unless for this project um, they include a lot of work that was made in the Nanyang um, Fine Art Academy in the 1970s so a lot of the work features Singapore and elements of Singapore that no longer exist so places in Chinatown that don't exist but also a couple of works here where I'm remaking a bed that she got produced in Singapore um, and I'm left with the bits and pieces of it and they need to find a way of reconstructing it. So there's a certain amount of reconstruction um, and reenactment and appropriation, um, but also potentially, which is something that Sabapathy you said mentioned about the kind of coherence between the works of my sister, my mother and myself, probably because we're using the same clay, the same methods that she's using, um, but equally that she becomes the reason why I am an artist. Um, so there is an important sort of um, art historical element of that, which is these um, gene genealogical connections, as well as kind of constellations with other artists, as well as cultural context that one is um, part of. Um, and then also thinking about the different stories that can be told from them. Now, I'm aware that it's kind of, um, I had a couple more slides that I don't think I'll show because it's probably a moment that if anyone wants to ask a question they can do and obviously if they don't then that's fine don't look like any questions maybe the conversation has oh somebody has oh it's adele yeah adele's so just also to say that um adele tan who's has she said that she's a yes yeah, she has um she's just texted me to say the kim lim show in singapore is um next year um yeah. June 2023, curated by um, Adele Tan and Jolene Lowe. Yes. So um, other sort of connections. And I think we will be doing a conversation with Adele and I will be doing something around Kim Lim a little bit later, um, heading towards that. So what does she say? Given that the speculative is the operative concept for this talk presentation, I'm curious as to the position of the voice of a rather powerful person in the male figure of TK Sabapathy in this new narrative trail and value creation. 
true. Was there also a speculative attempt to recast Sabapathy into a feminist reshaping art history, referencing Kathleen's essay subtitle? Can he be pressed into forming other articulations? I think I might have to pass that one to you, Kath. Yeah, no, I mean, a uh, solid, <laughs> that's a solid question. Yes, um, okay, uh, <laughs> how, let me, on one level, um, I think he can be pressed and I don't actually think he's. Oh dear, just, <laughs> just at the right moment. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you, you hung to go back a couple of um, sentences. Okay, two you... sentences. Yes, yes. So, um, okay. So, yes. Can he be pressed into forming other articulations? Yes, he can definitely, I think, be pressed. I mean, I think that, you know, he's still producing text and he's still working and doing research and he's referencing his more, you know, he's even. Um, considering his own legacies and putting his, you know, reconsidering his work. So yes, I think he can be pressed into forming other articulations. Um, and obviously, yes, Adele always, Adele, you always pick this up very well. Um, there is obviously an uh, instrumentalization of Sababachi's voice being done with that essay, because obviously if a preeminent art historian and also that he curated this show and the show ends up becoming important, not just because he says it's important, but actually other curators like Constance Shears go, um, go on to actually quote and reference the show in their own exhibition catalogs um, years down the line. Um, you know, there's a total value creation a little bit happening, right? Because that's now been pointed out on some level. Mm. And it's interestingly being noted in a book that's being put together by the artists, right, Erica? You. <laughs> so it's interesting too, because you know it's yeah. It I I, I have been called out. That was my little subversion there. But because, maybe it's not just called out. This is about systems of knowledge building. <laughs> so in a way, that's using a particular figure um, mm -hmm. to try and develop some kind of. Um, mm -hmm. I am trying in this work as well to create resonances and. Mm -hmm. Um, a sense of value, whether the sense of value is the same as that by which Sabapathy can kind of create, or whether it's because it becomes an interesting kind of conceit to bring um, four women together um, and sustain, whether it has done or not, but sustain a sort of focused viewing. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you, you know, the methods it, within the film of film editing, so cutting together is also, um, I'm, I'm using that as a kind of reference point to, I suppose, um, structures, understood structures that we may use to um, create some sort of coherence. So within film, we edit conversations together. And in this particular film, there are two ways of editing conversations. One, which is two, two women are seen on screen and they aren't talking together, but they are actually edited so that they speak together. Um, in sort of these monologue moments. And the other is um, the editing of oral history interviews and um, statements that the artists have written that become the script that the, 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 the four actresses try and reenact. And that's also why the conversation at times is quite um, stultifying. It doesn't quite work, um, but there are affinities within what is focused on in some of those texts that allow me, or I feel it allows me to bring these things into, um, uh, proximity. So there's something about proximity here as well with Sabapathy. It's, it's sort of saying acknowledging um, his possible position in art history in Singapore, and it's positioning something in relationship to that. Equally, well, I might say that um, I'm doing that here in this conversation too, so that um, as an artist, I'm inviting you both to come into this space, into the filmic space of the work, and um, for us to talk together. Um, it's not necessarily an interview where you're interviewing me or I'm having to account to you, but we're sort of speaking together in proximity. Um, and that's why I've also included the screen on the background so that we feel like we're in a virtual space or we appear that we're in a virtual space together. Um, I'm aware that time is coming up to the end and David, a male figure may pop up any moment now and say, oh, we have to end this. Um, but before he does, um, it feels like the time has gone super, super fast. I hope I haven't sort of um, hogged it too much, but if there's anything else that 
either of you feel like was touched upon and we couldn't quite get there or say something, um, I suppose now is the moment in time where please do bring it forward. Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, I think Adele's point about uh, supper party, you know, it made me think, if I may briefly, I think it's probably opening a can of worms to a much bigger <laughs> topic we won't have time to cover. Um, but it is the kind of writing of national art histories, right? Um, and without kind of shift, pushing this towards the Kim Lin uh, figure too much, you know, it's about, I mean, I'm very interested in the kind of this interest, uh, which which is very much of our time now of a reconstruction of, or a rewriting or a reframing, decolonizing, or whatever you might want to call it of, of you know, national uh, kind of on one hand, you have this idea of the transnational, you know, which is very much kind of vaulted and valued these days as something that's breaking down these very staid um, categorical understandings of, of um, identity and belonging and so on. Um, but on the other hand, you see, you know, we see this in the UK as well, uh, as well as in Singapore, this real kind of concerted effort to reinsert, you know, various figures of, as we've been dis discussing into uh, you know, the canon or whatever it is. And that, that you know, those two things seem to be at odds with me uh, in, in my thinking. And also the idea of bringing these four transnational, you know, minor figures as it were, uh, together in a dialogue uh, based on the fact that they have kind of Singapore as a connection and that sort of quite specific uh, national, you know, interface in, 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 a, in the kind of cultural context of Singapore, the experience of Singapore. Um, so I think the idea of the national slash transnational, uh, you know, is an aspect that that the work um, speaks to in, in quite interesting and and quite ambivalent ways, I might say. Mm. Yeah, I think in the co context of this conversation, it, um, because of who's in the room now speaking, um, you know, the Singapore connection becomes something that's, um, you know, becomes writ large. But actually, there's also thinking about. Uh, Dora Gordine's stay in Paris and Georgette Chen's stay in Paris. Um, you know, that's also quite an important moment. So my mother being in London and Kim Lim being in London. So one of the stories I didn't tell you about was that my mother was down the road studying when, when Kim Lim was studying in um, Central St. Martins and my mother was doing window dress display wanting to be a student in Central St. Martins, um, looking across to those students and just sort of fantasizing about being there. And then Kim Lim would have been there walking past, you know. Um, and this is the time she meets my Chinese father in a park in London. And, you know, there's, again, there's lots of um, moments where one could speculate um, on different sorts of stories. Um, but yes, the Singapore context has become kind of be because we're in this virtual world and because we are who we are, um, I think that's where, you know, it starts to gravitate towards. Um, but yes, we haven't managed to sort of touch on, if we think about the figure of Kim Lim too and her own histories, I think very fascinating the way in which she operated between different places and has become incorporated in certain kinds of historicizing now that elevates a position that wasn't necessarily so obvious at one point. Um, but okay, we have another question and maybe that can be the last one. Um, it's from my sister. Um, will you be writing and speaking about the film edits more soon? Enjoyed the speculative possibilities within the moments between their monologues, as frustrating as they were, perhaps consider keeping the film accessible online for longer. <laughs> okay, Heidi, will do. <laughs> um, I think with that, um, with the familial kind of reminder to, you know, do more <laughs> as, as that's very Singaporean as we are, like do more, do more. Um, David's come in just at the right time to sort of round it off. And just for me to say thank you both for being in conversation. It's been really great to speak to you all. Um, yeah, thank you. It's been amazing. Thank you, thank you the three of you. And uh, and to everyone for, for listening in the film. Um, Heidi and everyone else will be online at least for one more week and uh, until the 16th of July in full and I very much hope that the project continues to have this amazing life. Um, it will do through the book so the book is available, <laughs> Erica promptly holding it up, is, is uh, being made as we speak and uh, Erica's making it by hand with uh, Alex Stilwell from uh, from the gallery um, and we're hoping that the, the the book will actually be given I was thinking in relation to kind of uh, archives and libraries but we would want to make sure that the book 
um, is available for people to read through archives and libraries. So if there are archives and libraries that people would like to see that book located, please do let us know, but it is also available for sale through the gallery. And um, I'd, I'd like to thank the three of you, Kathleen and Wendy and Erica for being the most amazing Stanley Picker Fellow um, exemplary and just to, to, to connect so many different narratives and so many different uh, people through a fellowship project, but also have it so entirely rooted in our locality in Kingston upon Thames through Dorwich House Museum. Um, I think it's just absolutely brilliant. And please do, if anyone has an opportunity to come to Kingston and to visit Dorwich House, I, I do encourage you uh, to do that. It's, it's quite, quite a special place. So thank you so much everyone for, for um, giving your time this afternoon. Amazing. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.